It's mm-hmm. a pleasure to have you on Deep Dive. Mm-hmm. Um, Thank you. <laughs> huge fan of your work, and I'm so glad that you are on this um, show with us. It's a pleasure to have you. Thank you. Now, I mean, I want to talk to you about, um, you know, the state of our movie industry um, mm-hmm. in, in Nigeria, the mm-hmm. quality of the work that we do, uh, and the quality of some of your work. I mean, mm-hmm. but before I... I get on to all of that. I just like to first um, start by talking about you. Um, mm-hmm. Your mother was 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 a professor. Mm-hmm. You, you know, your father was a politician. Mm-hmm. I, give me a sense of what growing up um, in a house of a professor and a politician looked like when you were a kid, and the kind of influences that um, they had on you growing up. It, it was rowdy. It was very rowdy. My parents, my parents argued about everything from communism to capitalism, <laughs> socialism. It was just it was rowdy. They they used to have debates. They were the first set of people in my life that I, that taught me how to debate without getting angry at each other. They would debate from morning to night about different things, about philosophy, about all that. So I was just being all of them like, wow, these guys are so intelligent. <laughs> you know. So they would just debate and then they go and have lunch, they go and have dinner. And it was just cool. And so Naturally, when I grew up, I, I was in a debating society, my not school, primary school type thing, because I learned it from my parents. And but it was very interesting. It was very, very interesting how they were very different, and yet they were together. My mom, they were actually, even physically different. My mom was tall and dark. My father was short and fair. <laughs> <laughs> my mom went to church. My father never went to church. <laughs> You know, they were just very different, and they were together, and it was it was a good thing to see. Mm, interesting. You, yeah. you credit your mother a lot for, um, you know, her influence on you mm. and and the nudge mm. towards filmmaking. Yeah. What was it about her that influenced you and pushed you towards um, filmmaking? I, I, I think um, books. My mom used to make me read books. Maybe because she was trying to get rid of me and like, yo, sit down in one corner and don't stress me. Because she has papers to mark and all that. Mm. So she would go to the library and rent like lots of books. And I would just dive in there and just read a lot of books endlessly. And and she would make me write a review for each book. I remember I read um, Gone with the Wind when I was probably like 11, 12. And I had to write a review for that book and all that. And so... Not only did she t- teach me how to read these books, but to understand what I was trying to read. And so that helped me develop a lot. And actually, I, I never wanted to be a director. I wanted to be a sitcom writer. <laughs> I wanted to be a sitcom writer. And it's also in, partly, uh, in part in front of my father, who was a bit of a comedian. My dad was so funny. He would make jokes about every single thing. And then I now grew up watching like traditional sitcoms with live audience and laughing tracks. So I also wanted to write comedy. You know, so both of them had like different influences. My mom was more introspective, but yeah. my father was more loquacious, more loud. Yeah, you know? yeah. You know, so both of them had you, influence you, on me. You, you lost both parents when you were still a teenager, yeah. and um, uh, first you, you might want to talk about the circumstances in which you lost both of them, mm-hmm. and, and then of course how it was difficult for you to step out of life mm. um, at 16 um, mm. to become a man yeah. and to find a path you know in your world what was it like for you my mom died when i was 13 and uh, 995 she had diabetes and my father had a heart attack like three years later um maybe he couldn't live without her <laughs> you know um it was so difficult so being going from a middle class kid to a very poor child yeah. and being kicked out of my house by my relatives and and just going through all that it, it was um there were times i just used to be very I, I i i think i still deal with that that hurt um just not being anybody's kid you know i still deal with that that pain and hurt but i found a way to live with it um the good thing though is that my parents raised me well that's what I love about the memory I have of them. They taught me a lot of the things, almost like they knew they were going to go. They taught me so much about what I needed with, to do in life, how yeah. I needed to treat people, yeah. how I needed yeah. to. My mom taught me to be compassionate. And my father taught me to be a leader. And so when I combined both uh, attributes of my parents, you know, it made me a stronger person. And in some way, I'm grateful that I went through that because I'm able to understand to help somebody else when I see them yeah because yeah. I can look at you without you saying something I can tell you know what you're going through and yeah. I can offer the help without you saying much you know especially as us men we don't say a lot about what we're going yeah. through you yeah. see a man that is down and out he's still trying to keep his pride up 
They're like, bro, come on, I know what it is. Someone yeah. sit down, have a drink, make him some food. <laughs> you know what it is. I think that's that's so, really inspiring so, yeah. to, to lose both parents yeah. at 13 and step out of the home at 16. It's mm. quite an incredible uh, um, story. But but you went on um, to produce your, your first movie, I, I think at age 26, it was yeah. Lemon Green. Yeah. Mm. Um, you even won an award for that yeah. movie. Yeah, we're, we're all what, sorts of festivals. What, what was it like for you, the, the sense of accomplishment, um, the adversity that you had to overcome mm, and, and at mm. 26 you you were a superstar how mm-hmm. did that make you feel i don't think i was a superstar yet but i was just one of the rising stars <laughs> the business there um like i said i I'd always wanted to make uh, sitcoms but um, along the line i started working in different productions and i started learning things about them and and so i decided okay i'm going to make my first film lemon green because i, I, I kind of like introspective films and that sort of films and so I wrote it, and then I shot it. Um, it all started like, because my whole set, it all started like almost like a joke. I just said, listen, I'm going to make a film called Lemon Green. This is a story. The story was about a writer who discovers he has a child, and then the writer is dying and discovers he has a child, and then he has to take care of his child and all that sort of thing. And so I, um, I wrote the, I remember writing the story before my brother died. <laughs> you know, I wrote the story while I was with my brother. My brother had a stroke. And then he dies. When he died, I said, you know what? I'm going to make this film in memory of my brother. And I went and I made, I made it. I made it with my last salary. Then I was work, work, we were working on a show called Project Fame. Yeah. And so when they paid me my salary for the last uh, a month of the season, I took it, took a bus to Joss, took my whole crew and said, this is we're going to make a film. <laughs> <laughs> and so we made Lemon Green. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Uh, and then in 2015, was it? You won your first... Um, yeah, was, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, uh, with the movie Hard Times. Yeah. Um, yeah. What was it like? What was it like? Uh, that's like the zenith uh, <laughs> of, of the movie business in Nigeria. Yes. How, did that, how yeah. did that make you feel? It, so the previous year, uh, I made a film called Have a Nice Day for Everybody Life TV. Yeah. And it was nominated for Best Cinematography. But I lost that to a film called Nairobi Half Life which is a brilliant film, by the way. But I was angry. (laughs) I was angry at myself because I felt I could have done better. I I said to myself, I said, I could have made a better film. I could have worked better. I could have done it better. And so I went and wrote Hard Times. And the following year, I won the MVC for Hard Times. And I was like, yeah, see, look at that. (laughs) All I had to do was work hard. (laughs) Do that better. You, you talked about uh, always trying to make movies that were introspective. Mm-hmm. And, I, mm-hmm. and I, I noticed the common thread mm-hmm. um, with your movies. You're always trying to, um, you know, turn a mirror on society. Yes. Uh, you know, to, to have a look at themselves. You're trying to change yeah. culture. Yeah. Um, you're trying to, to tell a lesson. Um, do you think that movies really have the power to change culture and transform uh, um, societies, or it's just about storytelling for you, or you want to go beyond telling um, beautiful stories and entertaining people to transforming society with your movies. I, I mean, they, there are all sorts of movies that people should make. Um, don't get me wrong. Sometimes I'm, I'm watching Africa Magic Epic, and I'm watching people in the village try to steal somebody's land, and it's funny, <laughs> <laughs> and I like it. So there's room for all sorts of films. Um, so the, the kind of films I make, I decided that this is the kind of films I will make. Yeah. No matter what I see, what I see in an indie format or a blockbuster format or a series, I'm going to make introspective stories that talk about certain things. Now, the films in themselves may not be as popular as I am, uh, but what what it, what it will do and what it has done for me is that it has had some disciples for that style. So I have people that swear by that style, people that imitate that style, people that want to be like me and make those kind of stories. Those people may eventually become make bigger films than I, yeah, I am making, and I'll be happy for that. It's like a case of John, the, John the Baptist and Jesus, and John the Baptist came first, and Jesus was the savior. But John the Baptist wasn't very popular, but it was literally John the Baptist setting up <laughs> the thing for that. So for me, my philosophy is: if one person watches my film and goes out and helps the next person then for us, we've achieved what we came to achieve mm. in this life. And that's it. If I'm dying, I'm going to heaven because one person went and watched my film and went and helped somebody else. You, I mean, you sound like a preacher. In the <laughs> I am. Street, but <laughs> 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 I mean, it, 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 it's not about money for you, right? It's about touching people. It's about touching lives, about transforming society, really. Is yeah. that what is it? Yeah, but I mean, I do make a lot of money, but I mean... <laughs> 
<laughs> but it's not primarily about it's not primarily about money. <laughs> it's not primarily about money. But I mean, I do make a lot of money from my films, yeah. um, which I was trying to explain to people, and sometimes people don't understand what it is. If you make a film for twenty million naira, for ten million naira, and then over the course of the year you make sixty million naira, you've made five times six times the profit yeah. that your film makes yeah. if you make a film for 100 million naira and you and you make a 100 200 million yeah. naira in a year you probably make less money in terms of percentage than i will do yeah yeah you know and so if my cost is minimized i i, I hedge my risk yeah. my risk yeah. i'm not exposed as you are yeah but i still make that much money mm. in the same period of time yeah there you are with the le- with less hassle so true there's a trick to it but primarily money is not really what drives me to make films it's just Telling stories, I always imagine that if the world ends and aliens come and take over the world, I want them to. I want to put my films in a time capsule and they'll take it and like, okay, this is what, <laughs> this is how these humans started. <laughs> these humans. We're, we're going to talk about the, um, um, the entire business model, yeah. you know, um, of the movie industry and yeah. the movie business, how yeah. you guys make money. But first, let's talk about the state of, of Nigeria's movie industry mm-hmm. um, because of course it's, it's grown over the years mm-hmm. um, it's better picture quality yeah. better production mm-hmm. better sound mm-hmm. but one thing that continues to be your Achilles heel mm-hmm. I mean given the commentary that mm-hmm. we, we get and reviews mm-hmm. is that the storytelling ability has really not evolved mm-hmm. and, and a lot of Nigerian movies are still struggling to tell um, uh, brilliant stories yeah. Where is the problem really the fact that we don't have enough storytellers in Nigeria mm. or we're not paying these storytellers enough to be able to put out wonderful script and turn them into production? Where, where really is the problem? People don't know how to write. Period. Oh. People don't know how to write. Um, there's a, there's a, in this generation, there's a lot of hype before substance. And so somebody writes something that was done that was mediocre and overhyped. Oh, this is the person that wrote that, 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 mm. that, that, that. And because that on that pedestal, they refuse to learn. They refuse to learn new things. Um, there's so many directors that have had scripts that they've paid for that they can't shoot. I'm sure that an average director has four or five stories that they've paid for that they cannot shoot because the story isn't good. Uh, and also, even as a director, you must also be involved in your storytelling. And so there's not also... A lack of expertise also in directing so it's not just to see the fine pictures as directing the story is directing in fact directing should probably be about the story and less about your camera angles and how beautiful they look it yeah. should be the story because you can shoot a film with a camera phone and it can it can be good you know so but also viewers also so there are two sides to it viewers also are not sophisticated enough to understand the stories i think the 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 you need to suspend disbelief or whatever the term is when you're watching a film you need to open your heart to to learn and to read the subtext in the story and sometimes you see a film and they're like subtext and everybody's missing the subtext and everybody's talking about oh this girl was so nice in that scene but there was a subtext there there was an easter egg that was placed there by the mirror that you saw at the end of the film yeah. didn't you get did you connect yeah. that yeah. the guy yeah. that sold <laughs> Zobo to you was the same guy that murdered the girl. The, you know, this is some like I'm seeing. I was seeing some reviews of uh, Blood Sisters this morning, and people just talking. I'm like, people are completely missing the subtext of the whole production. Mm. You know, people are talking about the peripherals. So also, there is audience sophistication. Audience also need to learn about films. I'm in a, re- I'm in a couple of Reddit group. Um, you know, with with just regular Americans that watch regular films. And I'm not knocking down my people because I know that we also watch also yeah. films and we also understand them. But it seems that the more people, there are more people there that are interested in understanding the film, and less about the periphery of the film. We we seem to be carried away with who's in the film than what the film is about. Mm. Oh, okay, ah, this guy's in the film. Anytime I see his film, I always like to watch it. Let me go and watch it. And then come back. Oh, the story wasn't uh, too many plot holes. Blah, blah, blah. But did you really watch it? Do you, do you watch it for criticism or do you watch it to understand what the story is about? I saw some brilliant films being criticized. Uh, there's a film that was at the first that opened at the festival, uh, one of the Afro festivals, and I come online and people say, "Oh my God, this film was it." I'm like, "Yo, bro, did you really watch the film?" <laughs> it seems a bit like a chicken and egg situation. Yes. Audience sophistication and the quality of writing. Yeah. Which should give first? Uh, which do we have to improve first? Um, because I, I, for me, I think audiences can play catch up if the mm-hmm. quality of mm-hmm. writing goes up. So, mm-hmm. so how do we fix that um, 
storytelling ability? Do, do we have to open our minds more? Because I would argue that Nigerians used to be very good storytellers. Mm -hmm. We used to write mm -hmm. um, books that you know travel around the world. So, so where's the problem? Is it not enough training? We're not um, finding the right talent? Is it the death of um, our publishing industry in Nigeria? How can we fix you know that 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 problem? So there's a domino effect of all these things, and I'm going to start from distribution. Now, distributors determine what film gets shown, hmm. and what are the films that make the most money. If you look at it, the the films with the most basic stories ever. Hmm. You know, these are films that make the big money. Now, subconsciously, as a filmmaker, you're programmed to try and make a film that's like that. Okay, let's say a film about two friends that find a bag full of money and then all sorts of people are trying to come and get them. Now, that can be an interesting story. But how many times are you going to make the same story? Mm. A film about a wedding and all, all the families are fighting over the wedding. How many times are you going to make the same story? Do you understand? Yeah. But yeah. because the distributors give the impression that this is what is making money, why don't you make something yeah. similar? Yeah. And so, as a business, you think like, what can I make that can be similar that will make me that much money? Let me use this formula yeah. that yes. yeah. and you must understand the kind of people that are criticizing the film. Yeah. What is the back, their background? I'll give you an example. I made a film called The Coffin Salesman. It didn't really pick up here. And I showed a film in Durban in South Africa and I have good reviews for it. Mm. I made a film called The Harry Macaulay Affair. I had scatting reviews on there, but I'm literally in France and people are treating me like Jesus Christ. Mm. <laughs> and so you so you understand that like okay that two days ago one of my students called me and said man all the titles have been picked because he was pitching my titles to a broadcaster I said all the titles have been picked you know you're the only titles that your only films are the only films that have been picked completely from my catalog including my series and we're laughing on the phone I'm like yo bro don't joke with me I'm the best <laughs> so a lot of times and I get, I get, I get criticisms all the time, even on my person, like even on Twitter, because I'm mostly on social media. They put that comment that like, "More Jesus Christ, what is this? Quit, resign, <laughs> just give up, bro." <laughs> but then I also get good reviews as yeah. well. So, 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 so I think the school of thought that yeah. um, art is subjective and yeah. um, shouldn't really be subject to a lot of scrutiny and all of that. It's, it, the beauty is in the eyes of the beholder. Yeah. Or you think that, yes, people have a right to criticize um, a movie that they think, you know, isn't that good or doesn't meet yeah. your expectation. Yeah. Where do you fall in that school of thought? I, I, feel, I feel critics must have integrity. Mm. They must have integrity. I don't mind you criticizing me, but how about that taste of a widow that we just saw? How's that film better than my film? Be honest to yourself. You know, have integrity. Don't criticize people you don't like. Mm. And the people that are your clique have a big, a higher rating. Yeah. Because yeah. now you're losing your integrity. Because one day I costed one critic and he stopped criticizing in total. You know, he doesn't criticize normally. He said, you know what, I quit. I pointed out that he didn't have integrity. I said, I don't mind you criticizing me, but have integrity. Let's let's know what the standard of a good film is. Because in Nigeria, you don't even know what's a good film anymore. Yeah. What is a good film? You know, like you see films that people are hyped, like, yo, 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 yo. And then you watch it like, wow, bro. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think that standard thing is a problem everywhere, not just yeah. in the movie industry. Because we don't even know how to, if you say this governor was excellent. Yeah. What were the parameters? We don't seem to have parameters of measuring, of measuring. anything. Yeah, know? that's why I say subjective. It's what yeah. you like. <laughs> if I like you, what do you do can be wrong to me. Exactly. You know, so uh, so let's let's talk a bit about. Um, cause you, you talked about um, how you make monies from your movies, yeah. and and I and I would like to go a little bit deeper yeah. into that because yeah. um, I think that for me, um, the, the Netflix of this world, the, the Amazons, um, and, and mm -hmm. to be quite honest, the, the cinemas. Mm -hmm have allowed filmmakers like you to make more money mm. than you know um, when it was solely about the distributors mm -hmm. in alaba mm -hmm. you know um it, it, is that model um, um sustainable um and more importantly because many of these platforms are international and global platforms mm -hmm. how can we or why is why are there no local distribution platforms available for mm -hmm. people to purchase movies uh, or films that you make, mm. um, you know, and distribute locally. Why, why don't we have such 
um, opportunities locally? Why does everybody have to pitch um, to production companies or distribution companies internationally before they can uh, put food on their table? Because the dollar, man, the exchange rate. <laughs> but I mean, the, 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 we still license here. Lots of filmmakers license here. Uh, there's Euroco, Africa Magic, the, the different um, platforms that buy films locally. But the reason why a lot of us sell overseas is they pay more value for, for the art. Yeah. Pay way more value. The money that somebody probably pays for children of mud, I'm, I'm never going to make it selling locally. Mm. You know, the money someone's going to pay me for having Macaulay, I'm, not gonna, I'm never going to make it locally. Mm. You know, and the truth is that we're also sat, super saturated with content. Every day you wake up, there's a new film, there's a new skit, there's a new thing. At the point, you know, we're like the the capital of, of filmmaking in, in this zone of Africa. Yeah. In, in most of Africa, we're the third biggest in the world. So the saturation is a, it's a lot. And mm. so when there's a lot of saturation surplus here, you need to share to other people because there's demand for it also. And so, bro, I'm not going to lie, they pay a lot of money for these things. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I guess that we are benefiting from the huge, uh, or rather, do you think that we're benefiting and profiting from the huge amount of diasporans that we have? Because mm. there are a lot of Nigerians, um, um, you know, in Europe, Germany, mm, yeah. States, um, United Kingdom. Yeah. Is that is it was is that really the turning point for us? Because these people consume many of this content and are willing to pay for this content. Um, is, is that where? Uh, many of these benefits come from where people are willing to pay top dollar, um, you know, for, for films like, like that mm -hmm. which you produce here. Yeah. I, I mean, it's just it is diaspora. People from different cultures watch our films. I mean, Children Mod is on Apple TV, and it's not just a diaspora thing. Um, recently, we're having some deals with some big broadcasters in the US. I don't want to say the names because I have a non disclosure agreement. Yeah. And those are not. African people at all, those uh, Caucasians, <laughs> you know, so there's a demand for our content because we live in an era of inclusivity, people want to be included, you know, black people want their identity, yeah. and so the capitalists are harping on that, to use that to exploit mm. uh, more mm. people of color, mm. you know, to tune into their channel or to sign up to yeah. their program it's like listen up look at all this african programming that we have for you mm. sign up for 50 dollars here <laughs> you know so it's purely capitalism it's yeah. not they don't love us that much yeah. they just realize that people are tired of seeing ben affleck do yeah. the same thing yeah. you know same facial expression people are tired of seeing those guys so like who are these other guys you know mm. and so here we produce a lot of films cheaply and so they like, she couldn't believe you could make a film with that amount of money. Wow. <laughs> exactly. That, so we've not even scratched the surface of what we're capable of doing because of financing and yeah. all of that. Yeah. But we're trying. That's why I can, personally, I don't criticize Nigerian filmmakers because we're trying so hard. It's very difficult, you know, to be able to make a film of a certain quality yeah. without funding. Literally, we, we, we've created an industry with little or no funding. Yeah. And so we deserve praise. Yes, we need to improve our art, but people need to understand that it's never going to be the same as, you know, working on Stranger Things mm. or working on Game of Thrones. You, you, you're very vocal, you know, about discipline, mm. men discipline, yeah. um, Twitter and yeah. all of that. Yeah. Uh, maybe maybe it's, 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 it's nice that we talk a bit about, um, you know, um, delegations of sexual harassment yeah. and in the movie industry yeah. in Nigeria. Yeah. Um, even though it's not gutting... Um, the kind of attention that mm -hmm. is gotten in Hollywood. Yeah. Um, you, you hear pockets, you know, mm -hmm. selling mm -hmm. roles yeah. for sex and yeah. all of that. Yeah. Um, why or how do we deal with this uh, uh, problem um, mm -hmm. in the filmmaking? Advantage. And all comes down to a bit of desperation of trying to get in there. And, and for me, I always tell people, I always tell women especially, don't worry about it. The thing about performance and acting on the arts is that even if you're in your 40s you can still get there you can still um what's this guy is this british guy that um was in inglorious bastards i remember his name now he got his, like his first big role when he was getting to his late 30s 40s and he's gone on to become you know been in a lot of big films i think he's been for an oscar as well yeah so also I think that guilds also, once we have stronger guilds, you can call a member of your guild and say, 
you know what these things you, you hold each other to a standard yeah and then people will know that you can't do shit like that yeah. you know that thing is going to get you in trouble it, and it's not just a, a nigerian problem it's, it seems to be an industry problem because mm. in the u.s there's stories like yeah. that yeah you know so it's something that has to be continually recognized by the law and people must be penalized for it yeah i like the fact that you yeah. talked about the law yeah. um, how do you draw the line yeah. because while we say that a lot of um women are being harassed like you said because it's been perpetrated over yeah. a long period of time yeah. you have a group of young girls mm -hmm. who um, think they can get this role mm -hmm. by, by throwing themselves yeah. at mm -hmm. setting producers so, yeah. so how do you how do you draw the line between those who um, throw themselves at these producers to get mm -hmm. those roles mm -hmm. and, and those that um, uh, those producers who actually mm -hmm. um, go out of their way to harass this um, young girls and there's even a whole third angle of false accusations also exactly, exactly. <laughs> there's exactly. a whole like people can so, literally wake up and say shit and and if you don't find a way to defend yourself yeah, exactly. or prove your innocence you could also be in trouble yeah it's um the truth is that it's a thin line between consensual sex by adults and sex due to coercion yeah it's up to now individual cases for you to prove that you did not coerce the person to sleep with you <laughs> <laughs> because yeah it can literally happen you could be dating somebody and you guys break up yeah and the person can say yeah you know this person harassed me when yes. i was dating him yes yes or this girl set me up when i was yes. dating her and the people can see that's why she got that role or xyz role and she can prove that she can go on and say those things and if you don't have enough Proof to prove yourself that becomes a problem so I think that in general issues of sexual harassment needs to be more the law has to be more stringent in yeah. in in the punitive measures that it, 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 if somebody goes to jail for 21 years somebody goes to jail for 30 years somebody you know if somebody's used to set an example yeah I think that everybody will realize that mm. you don't do that what I do personally for me is, even in my contract with my crew is even started there no sexual harassment, nothing. Even when my sound guy is about to put a mic, you need to take consent. I need to yeah. hear you to get yeah. the consent from yeah. that. Yeah. You know, I, I mean, I fired somebody from my set for, you know, trying to tell an extra to come meet him in a, in a hotel to get her money. <laughs> <laughs> Even though he didn't work for me directly, I just hired him. He was a BTS for the girl, so I just hired him for that period. And he was fired. And my lawyer just got on it and, and, and solved that immediately. And he had to write a letter to the girl apologizing and all sort, all sort of things. See, it's a like I said, it's a very gray area because sometimes I have also witnessed being on a set, a production manager coming and tapping an actress on the ass, and she was giggling. And I said, I don't think you should giggle about that shit. Mm. She, she's like, Oh, that's how we play. <laughs> okay. I'm, like, well, I'm not used to this. <laughs> I don't want to be here because <laughs> so I don't want anybody to say there was any more said that somebody was, you know, because that's what they yeah. target. But but I've also also you know known about accusations, false accusations that yeah. you, people have had to prove themselves that yeah. they, it wasn't them that did it. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. know because it's a gray area. But for me, I feel like the law must also must be stringent in terms of how people are punished for that. And then individual producers must also themselves make sure that the, the, the environment is safe for women yeah. to come yeah. to work. Okay, what, what's what's next for you? What, what's the next big? Um, what's the next big movie? What's the next? Um, you know, what's the next thing you're shining or, or turning a mirror on in society? Oh, uh, <laughs> I'm not turning a mirror, um, but um, I'm making a crime a crime noir um, called Runs, um, which is basically about a guy who's seeking revenge for the murder of his girl. Um, so that would be in black and white. I'm going back to my black and white roots. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, you want a lot of. Um, yeah, uh, <laughs> exactly. I'm going back to my, so that is going to be distributed by a company in the US. Uh, anyway, what makes it special? What makes the black and white movies special? Because people are concentrating on the story. <laughs> <laughs> there are no colors to distract you now. Yeah. Focus on the story. Yeah. Uh, but just a style. Um, I mean, uh, this film is more comic book style, and yeah. comic books when we're growing up more mostly in black and white. Yeah. Uh, almost like Sin City type uh, film. So that's what I'm doing. I, I've also signed an agreement to shoot a sci-fi um, for for NBC in the US. So that's still in the works uh, as well. Um, that I've written, created all the all the storyboards and everything. So once that kicks off, then those are the two projects I'm 
I'm working on. Fantastic. I know. think we'll be looking out uh, for them. But, you yeah. know, I'm, I'm not going to let you go without talking about somebody that we both share mutual respect for. Mm. Uh, Jose Moreno. Jose <laughs> 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 You know, um, um, the guy's my idol. But, but I'd just like to ask you, what, what about him uh, um, makes you tick? What is it about him that makes him... Um, that takes a special place in your heart. I like characters that come from a place of disadvantage mm. to to the summit. You know, when you're starting at, nobody gives you a chance. I like that. That's my that's <laughs> that's my life story. You know, uh, somebody being an interpreter, he wasn't from the football royalty at all. Never given a chance. Even even despite all his accomplishments, he's still never given yeah. a chance. Yeah. But despite all that, he is still going. So when I look at him. You probably can say he's narcissistic, but he had to be crazy to, to, to just find a way through for himself. And it, it reminds me so much of when I was, when I lost my parents and I had to come into this business. This business was so hard to break into because everybody had a name and a surname. Mm. This is uh, Adedi or Nogusaya. This is that, that, that. This is that. And I was like, oh man, how will I ever <laughs> get a look in? Yeah. You know, it was a difficult business. And you know, just I didn't grow up in Lagos. I didn't know anybody. So you know, just trying to make it through the business and getting to the point where I'm recognizable. Like at least if you say it more, more, someone knows who I am in the business. Yeah. So I, so I identify a lot with his struggles and mm. just trying to get there. I didn't get that. Still getting discredited. <laughs> <laughs> I think mean, it's a fascinating place to, <laughs> to, to end this conversation. <laughs> well, Moran, um, it's a pleasure to have had Thank this so wonderful much. chat with you. Thank and, you so um, much. I wish you the best in, in the upcoming movies. And Thank I you so hope much. that um, you take the world by storm. Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> 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 Thank uh, you thanks for having me. This is good. All right, cool. Thanks, brother. <laughs>